What's up, everybody? We are back to talk about everyone's favorite recycling enthusiast, the Resurrectionists. In this video, I'm going to take you through each of the Resurrectionist masters. We're going to go over a little bit about their backstory and why I think they're cool. And we're going to show some pretty pictures and art of the models in the crew so you can get a feel for how they look. And on top of that, I'm going to have Brandon from the Danger Plan chime in to tell us a little bit about how the crews play in the game. And hopefully with all of that combined, this will give you a better sense of which of these masters appeals to you and which one you want to pick up to play in the game. If you're not sure what the resers are for you, then be sure to take a look at this similar video that I did, breaking down all the factions of Malifaux to help you pick out which one you will like the best. And once you've picked your master, then be sure to check out the videos I've done on the individual masters, breaking down their lore and backstory in much more detail. But now let's get right into the resers. Seamus is the most wanted man in Malifaux. No one knows exactly how many people he's killed, but the man known as the Red Chapel Killer is responsible for so much death that he's well known across the whole city. In particular, he likes to target women, prostitutes, and raise the bodies of the dead to add to his army of zombie followers. As his legend grew, he became even more famous when he murdered the journalist Molly Squidpidge and then crashed her funeral to raise her from the dead and add her to his group of bells. He's even tried to unleash the grave spirit, the embodiment of death itself, that would have destroyed all life in Malifaux if he wasn't stopped at the last minute. His killing sprees continued, until he was finally killed by a member of the guild. But for some unknown reason, Molly used the Gorgon's Tear, the prison that holds an ancient and powerful entity, to raise him from the dead. Now the Gorgon's Tear is in Seamus' forehead, and he's gone on to participate in attacks against the guild enclave, his bloodlust never waning. Seamus is a bit of a comic book villain, He's definitely the most chaotic evil of all the Malifaux Masters. And his story definitely has a little bit of a creepy vibe to it. But if you're into undead, and especially undead that look like they could be members of high society, if not for a couple of extra pieces missing, then his crew will be right up your alley. He's kind of a cross between Jack the Ripper and a Mad Hatter. And he's got a gun that is one of the most powerful attacks in the entire game, so that's kind of cool if the zombie thing doesn't do it for you. But with that, let's go over to Brandon from the Danger Planet, who's going to tell us a little bit more about how to play Seamus and the Red Chapel keyword. Seamus leads the Red Chapel crew. His ragtag band of hookers, ex-high society gentlemen, hat salesmen, and terrifying psychopaths. The Red Chapel crew has a few signature abilities. The ladies of the crew have Scarlet Temptation, which makes enemy models within one inch of them have negative flips to willpower duels generated by other friendly models. Many of the models are disguised, hard to wound, and have very aggressively costed health pools, usually one or two higher than their cost, making them incredibly durable, as zombie ladies of the evening should be. And lastly, his crew has a bunch of different ways to hand out distracted and a trigger that's very common to do up to two more damage based on how much distracted the target has. Original Seamus and his totem also get plus flips and ignore friendly fire when attacking models engaged by one of Seamus' lads or lasses. And the totem has a really neat trick where he can swap places with Seamus as a bonus action from anywhere on the board. The original version of Seamus is one of the scariest models in the entire game with the ability to appear out of nowhere and blip around the board with his secret tunnels, I mean, passage ability, and the strongest damage track in the game at 468. Although he can usually only shoot once per turn, his bonus action lets him take a fourth action, and if he removes a corpse marker from the enemy table half, he can do it without any restrictions, including being able to shoot his 50 caliber flintlock a second time. Title Seamus, aka Sebastian Baker, has laugh off and stealth because he's a right proper gentleman, and he gets plus flips on models away from all of their friends and by themselves, as well as enemy models that take actions in his engagement get a free distracted thanks to his talent scout ability. He still gets to hit people for free if they enter his engagement outside of their activations with Y, hello, love, and he has an okay melee attack and a bonus action to move himself and the model he targets three inches. He also has gained a new ability to summon a Red Chapel minion once per turn off of a corpse marker that gets a little easier to summon if the corpse marker is fresh. And his aura ability is of particular note because he's one of the very few models in the game that can stop enemy models from benefiting from their own auras, which can completely ruin game plans for people if you insert Seamus 2 into an enemy bubble crew, for instance. All in all, Seamus can play as an incredibly strong bubble crew himself that benefits from all kinds of overlapping auras and buffs, or you can use Seamus as a mobile scheme runner in Seamus 1, or just as a single murder bot with minimal support in Seamus 2. Uh, love Seamus, great guy, huge fan. Molly Squidpage could have had a career as a journalist if it wasn't cut short. 
by Seamus. The famous serial killer murdered her and then raised her body from the dead and added her to his collection of bells. But when she was killed again, she was raised for a second time. But instead of a necromancer's spell, it was done with the power of the Gorgon's Tear. This gave Molly an unusual sense of independence for an undead, and she soon found herself disobeying her master Seamus. She soon made friends with Kirai and Koku, and the two of them went on a vigilante spree through the slums, taking down prostitution rings and killing pimps. She seems to have a knack for attracting misfits and outcasts, and she's gained a loyal following of strange and unusual undead creatures. She's tried to recreate a normal life for herself, and has even recently begun writing for newspapers again under a pen name, so no one will suspect anything. Her former master Seamus wants her back, but so far she's proven too clever for him. Molly's one of my favorite of the Resurrectionists because she shows that not everybody in the faction has to be evil. She's a really likable character because she's a bit of a weird person, and she always has kind of unfortunate things happening to her. Her crew is really weird because they're all sort of these strange companions that just sort of follow her around because they don't have anywhere else to go. And some of them are a lot of fun, like the disembodied head of a former research assistant called Philip, and Archie, which is a really big, hulking, undead construct that decided he was going to follow her around and protect her. But for more on Molly and the Forgotten Keyword, let's go back over to Brandon. Molly Squidpidge leads the Forgotten Crew, the dregs and laugh behinds of Malifaux's undead teeming masses. Her crew's main mechanic revolves around the fading ability, a front of card ability that gives each model in her keyword a special bonus whenever they discard a card for any reason. These might be something that debuffs your opponent's models, buffs your models, eats your opponent's scheme markers, or lets you maneuver around the board to better suit your goals. Molly has a lot of powerful, albeit somewhat fragile, models at her disposal, but one of them that you will hire in almost every list bears specific mention and might be in situ one of the strongest minions in the game, and that is the Kruligan. They can teleport around the board, they can remove ski markers when they get there, and they have two devastating melee attacks that can steal soul stones from your opponent's soul stone users, or push through three or four damage that your opponent isn't allowed to cheat against if they have more cards in hand than you do. The original version of Molly has all kinds of tricks, being a master with the incredibly powerful Lost Knowledge ability, an action that lets you remove any type of marker to draw two cards. She makes your opponent really contemplate and make decisions based on their hand size, allowing you to draw cards to match the number of cards they have when Molly activates, but punishing them with an attack that does irreducible damage, more so the further away from their maximum hand size they are. And with her signature ability, Constructive Criticism, she can make her already activated minions get to activate a second time in the turn, which is incredibly powerful. She's also hard to hit and hard to wound, which puts her in a great spot for any sort of schemey pool or any pool where you don't want your master to die. Her title version, Chaotic Conductor, is all about pitching cards for massive upside, allowing her own models to use their fading ability when she discards cards. And she lets you have a hand size of seven, she has a bunch of abilities that let you damage your opponent's models, reposition your models, and also she has an ability that lets you focus and heal one of her own keyworded models once per activation. She also has an aura that lets you cheat from the top of your deck in case you do run out of your massive card advantage. Kirai and Koku was forced into prostitution when she came to Malifo, but she soon met the son of the Governor General, and the two of them fell in love. The Governor General couldn't have this, so he sent a team of men to kill her, and his son was accidentally killed in the process. Through her pain and grief, and because of her possession of a magical ring that's connected to the tyrant the Gorgon, Kirai found that she had a powerful ability to control spirits. At first she wasn't even aware she was doing it, but she began working with a necromancer by the name of Nicodem, who tutored her to try to develop her abilities. Eventually the pain of her loss subsided, and she turned her focus onto vengeance. She and her friend Molly Squidpidge went around the slums destroying prostitution rings and getting revenge on the men who preyed on vulnerable prostitutes. But she's never forgotten about her lost love, and she's made connections with secret organizations to try to figure out a way to bring him back. Once she finally had everything she needed, she prepared a ritual that would have brought back the love of her life if Jackdaw hadn't interfered and ruined her plan. Kirai is probably my favorite of the Resurrectionist Masters. She obviously has a super tragic backstory, and it kind of turns her into just a rage machine that's just out for blood and seeking revenge all the time. But you kind of got to feel bad for her considering everything that she's been through. Her crew is full of ghosts and different kinds of spirits. And they're all pretty interesting and unique looking among the Resurrectionists. And they definitely have some of my favorite models among this crew. A lot of her stuff has connections to Japanese and more recently Vietnamese culture. 
So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, but you don't really like the 10 Thunders, then this might be the crew for you. But now let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Kirai and the Urami keyword. Kirai leads the Urami crew, made up of a zillion murder ghosts, her vengeance literally personified, and her dead ex-boyfriend, all thanks to Kitchener for being an intolerant jerk. The Urami crew has a few signature abilities and triggers, the most prevalent of which is Vengeance, an ability that causes any model that targets and damages the model but doesn't kill one to take some amount of damage back in recompense. Many of the models in the crew also have triggers that heal Kirai if they kill the target, that's called Feast of Vengeance, and abilities that apply the somewhat uncommon adversary condition, as well as several models that can prevent opponents' models from healing, which can wreak all kinds of havoc, and lastly, nearly all of the models in her keyword are incorporeal, which means they can move through enemy models and be moved through in turn, as well as ignoring some terrain and movement restrictions. The original Kirai version is a summoner. She has the ability to summon a single Yurami minion or her totem Ikirio once per turn that comes along with an upgrade that allows the model to build in the trigger for Feast of Vengeance, but each such model causes Kirai to take one irreducible damage at the start of its activation, making it a liability to have multiple summon models out at once. She does have a few ways to heal, and she can also support her own models through a heal action that has a few good triggers, and she can suffer damage when enemies would lose their adversary Yurami condition to keep it instead, making them all the more easy to kill next round. The title version of Kirai, Envoy of the Court, also summons, but she can only summon the Saishin, the Gaki, and potentially the best model in her keyword, the Enslaved Spirit, which you see all over Rezzers because they're also versatile. And it happens when one of her models moves through an enemy model that's near her, and then that model fails the subsequent willpower duel. Although she does have a separate bonus action that can let her summon back her fallen totem, Ikirio, if, if it's dead, just like the original version can do. She can also heal a friendly keyword model. She can move them around. She has an attack that's initially pretty weak, but gets stronger and stronger the more Yurami minions that are engaging the target. And all in all, both versions of Kirai, the Yurami keyword has a ton of ghosts, some very, very hard-hitting models, especially her very, very aggressive totem that has irreducible damage, and the somewhat unique ability to punish and tax every one of your opponent's choices and overall is incredibly flexible and very, very good at adapting to any situation because she can summon any models that she needs. One of the most notable landmarks in all of Malifaux is the Hanging Tree. It's seen by everyone who enters Malifaux through the Breach, a large tree where the guild hangs executed criminals. But among the bodies is one in particular that for a long time never seemed to move. It was rumored that it was impossible to cut the body down, and that occasionally it would disappear for a few hours at a time. There were also rumors that this jackdaw would sometimes lead angry groups of the dead to get revenge on those who had committed acts of betrayal. But in truth, jackdaw was once a normal man, until he met with a fate that was worse than death. Now he can sometimes be seen roaming around the city, or defending the hanging tree, though no one really understands what he might want. When Kirai and Koku tried to perform a ritual to bring back her lost love, jackdaw interfered, and it stopped her from bringing him back. But something went wrong, and now Jackdaw is changed. Jackdaw is a little bit of a mystery. We only know a little bit about his backstory, and we kind of get a little bit of a sense of what he's trying to do. But typically he's just kind of acting in the background, and he can be a threat in certain circumstances. His crew's made up of all sorts of, like, tortured souls, including the tormented who are literally just people being tortured. So it's definitely got a creepy and horror vibe to it. But now let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us more about Jackdaw and the tormented keyword. Jackdaw leads the tormented crew, the betrayed and tortured souls of Malifaux, bent on vengeance and inflicting and inciting pain on those who deserve it. Many of the tormented models have negative conditions or terrain that they can make, and generally give your opponent a rough time, with a particular emphasis on the staggered condition, centered around Montresor, the henchman who is all about it, and the hanged, minions who are super expensive, but attuned so they can use soul stones, and they get to treat all jokers that they flip or cheat as red, while making opponents, in opposed to duels with them, treat all jokers they flip or cheat as black. There are also several models that can give out negative upgrades that debuff or cause damage to the attached model, and that have usually some sort of horrible price that the attached model can pay to discard them, either through taking damage, or discarding cards, or not being allowed to cause damage to anyone during a whole activation. And nearly every model in the crew has the Torment ability, which lets them draw a card at the end of their activation if they damaged an enemy model that has an upgrade, whether it's one that they hired at the start of the game or one that you attached during it. And lastly, 
tons of models in his crew are terrifying. Jackdaw 1, the original Jackdaw, has the lowest health overall of any master in the entire game at 6th, but he has the unique ability to change any instance of damage suffered to one irreducible damage. And he has the ability to heal one instead of drawing a card anytime he would draw cards, as many times as he wants, so he tends to be quite durable if your opponent can't work around that. He's not technically incorporeal, but he walks and talks like a ghost, and has a scary melee attack. He can move any of his models or any enemy models that his crew has attached upgrades to with an opposed attack, and he can draw a bunch of cards if you've successfully upgraded a bunch of your opponent's crew within a small bubble. He also has the ability to hand out a bunch of slow, and his specific curse upgrade that he hands out causes the opposed model to get staggered at the start of each turn, and it doesn't actually have an exit clause like the rest of the Tormented Curses, so it is just there once he's given it out. Jackdaw and Sold has a real health pool in exchange for having to take real damage normally, and he's a real boy, well, ghost boy now, and makes any models he moves through has to test a pretty hefty move duel, or he gets to place them in base contact with Jackdaw after he finishes his move. His melee attack gets a glow up with an amazing trigger that lets you push 5 inches and damages anyone that it moves through unresisted, and it makes everyone that he pushes through have to test or place next to him. He also gives out a nasty upgrade that makes all enemy models treat the area within 3 of the upgraded models as hazardous 1, and that one stays until they pass a whole activation without damaging any models, itself included, which is really nasty when you stack two of them on models that are next to each other because they can't do anything if they don't just pass the activation. And he has an AoE push for all of his models and enemy upgraded ones, a really, really good tormented only heal or damage if you want to use it on your opponent's models, and a great ranged attack that can let him teleport to enemy models with the on your heels trigger. All in all, Jackdaw is a very, very punishing experience for your opponents, and is specialized in dismantling bubble crews, and is very, very scary, and has scary good mobility, with so many models in your crew being able to have on your heels. If you're enjoying this video and finding it helpful, then be sure to leave it a like, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and consider sharing it around with some folks who you think might find this helpful. If you do pick out a master and decide to pick up some models from Alpha, then consider using the weird affiliate link in the description below. If you do any shopping through Weird's web store through that link, it will actually give the channel a little kickback on the back end, so you'll be supporting me with no extra cost to you. There's also a link down there to my merch store if you want to pick up some Defective Dice merchandise, and my Patreon if you want to support the channel directly. You can get all sorts of different benefits, including ad-free versions of videos, early access to videos, extra entries in the giveaways that I do occasionally, and all sorts of other cool stuff. But with that, let's get right back into it. Dr. McMorning was a skilled surgeon when he came to Malifaux to work for the guild as a mortician, but not long after starting, he gave in to the whispers of the grave spirit and began experimenting in necromancy. At first it started pretty simple, but eventually his experiments got more and more elaborate, and he had to jump through more hoops to hide them from the guild. Soon he set his sights on his ultimate goal, creating a form that he could transfer his consciousness into in order to live forever. Eventually, he had enough helpers that he was able to do so efficiently, and was even trusted enough to rebuild Sonya Crid's face after an accident and do classified work on Lucius Matheson. But when McMorning found out that the Governor General intended to use a special relic to banish necromancy from the world for good, McMorning alerted his resurrectionist friends. They marched on the guild and stopped the ritual from happening, but in the process, he revealed himself to Lady Justice. Now that he's out of the guild, he no longer has access to their resources and is being actively hunted by the Death Marshals, but he's also got a newfound sense of freedom, as he can now experiment as he wishes, and doesn't have to hide his tracks. Dr. McMorning is a really interesting character, but for more on that, let's go over to McBluff, who I know is a big fan. Dr. Douglas McMorning, a genius in the innovative field of forensic science, a madman driven to depravity in pursuit of immortality. I've got to be honest, when I first got into Malifaux, I wasn't really drawn to McMorning. At least, not by his little blurb on the official webpage. It wasn't until I started looking deeper that I realized just how fascinating a character he was. Dr. McMorning is a comedic character. This was his major purpose in the early lore, to be a comical presence to balance out the utter depravity and wickedness of Seamus and Nicodem, to be just as horrid but in a much more humorous manner. Almost all of Malifaux's early content relied heavily on dark humor, a staple of the pulp horror genre it was a part of. Over time, the characters and the world itself started to become more layered, or in some cases, the horror of their actions was shown in a less humorous light. 
and these characters are now more likely to be the butt of a joke or the recipient of ill fate. What's curious, however, is that McMorning's character growth revolves around the maintaining of that humor. At the same time, he's being shown in a more human light, and those human elements are stripped away just as quickly as they were shown, as if mocking us for never thinking to look deeper until it was too late much like Lady Justice herself in the Death Marshals failed to do. We can see this clearly in his visual designs. In his first edition alternate art, he looks almost bestial with a wild mane of bright red hair and a Freddy Krueger-esque claw glove, smiling maniacally and posed like he's ready to strike. His apron and head mirror, along with a readied syringe, suggest he is a doctor of some kind, and the extreme messiness and bloodiness is not too far off from how most Victorian and Edwardian doctors might look while working. He's essentially a horror movie slasher with a doctorate at this point. One thing to keep note of, though, is his eyes. They're both brown, at least for now. We'll remember this for later. Moving onward to second edition, his art, as did most of the character art in Malifaux, became more realistic, at least to some level. His eyes are now covered by protective goggles, and he is not depicted as being impossibly skinny, with a smile that stretches across his face quite unnaturally. His hair is now less triangular, being somewhat closer to a mohawk. He has switched out his apron for a Howie lab coat, that iconic coat of many mad scientists in media. Along with a Final Fantasy character supply of belts on his waist, he is now also equipped with a collection of various surgeons' instruments. And again, returning to his eyes, they are now completely covered, blocking of that which is often seen as the clearest sign of humanity consciousness, a possession of a soul. By third edition, the Doctor has revealed his true allegiances and fled from the Guild, now falling fully into a madness that was already consuming him piece by piece for years. The way his face is rendered, you might think at first glance that he's wearing Joker's makeup, and this appearance is only enhanced by his creepy as ever smile, just as wide, if not wider, than before. However, his hair and his proportions have become noticeably more realistic. His hair is just as wild, but falls in a manner that could feasibly occur in real life. He is still quite skinny, but not to the point of looking unnatural. No, he truly looks like a human man, were it not for his unsettling face. In fact, let's look closer at his face, particularly his eyes. We can see that one of them, his right eye, is bleached white, likely due to continued exposure to chemicals. Finally, we arrive at his Malifaux Burns art. His hair has regained some more defiance of physics, and he also has a third arm now, one he grafted onto himself at his left elbow. He is wearing the same coat we saw in his third edition art, however it is noticeably dirtier, stained in a mixture of blood and whatever horrible substances fill the sewers of Malifaux he now calls home. One small note about his grafted arm, in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, Left-handedness was seen as a sign of evil or wickedness, and children were often forcibly trained to be right-handed if they were left-handed at birth. I can imagine having McMorning add another left arm as he loses more and more of his sanity and soul was an intentional design element. And looking at his eyes, we said that both are now bleached white, now bloodshot too, as McMorning runs on pure adrenaline, likely not having eaten, slept, or had anything close to a genuine human interaction in months. However, even with all these changes, his Malfo Burns art is the closest to human we have ever seen him, and, besides from perhaps his avatar form, is the furthest from human he has ever been. He is a man who has willingly lost all his identity in the pursuit of knowledge, to the point that he himself is now the experiment. Whatever good intentions he might have once had are echoes in a mind filled to the brim with voices and it is impossible to know for sure which is his own. Thanks so much, Big Bluff. Big Bluff's YouTube channel will be linked in the description below. It's got a whole bunch of really cool animatics on it, and many of them are Malifaux themes, so definitely check them out. It is one of my favorites. And now let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us more about Dr. McMorning and the experimental keyword. Dr. Douglas McMorning leads the experimental crew. His experiments, science projects, and lackeys all pumped up with ooze and running amok. The experimental crew's signature ability is perverse metabolism, which lets models with it heal instead of taking damage when they would suffer damage from the poison condition. 
The whole crew is basically built around corpse markers and stacking tons of poison everywhere on them so that they get some passive healing at the end of the turn, and they often spend the first round or the first few activations at least attacking each other to start building that poison up. Both versions of McMorning have an action where they can turn three corpse markers into the flesh construct, which is a heavy-hitting and reckless beater with a huge health pool but reasonably weak defenses, and the crew synergizes basically because of that really well with models like Grave Robbers or Ezekiel from the new Ashes of Malifaux book because of the ability for them to turn out corpse markers like there's no tomorrow. The henchman Sebastian also can summon canine uh, remains multiple times per turn, and he has a really high stat melee attack. The original version of McMorning gives poison to summon models automatically, ignores all defensive abilities on his melee attacks with the precise ability, which is at stat 7, gives out injured as a factor if they don't want to discard a card, and has crit strike, and all in all makes this deranged surgeon incredibly, incredibly adept at murdering almost anything. He also has the ability to transplant conditions onto models near his friendly models, and he has the ability blood poisoning, which is another ability that appears somewhat often throughout the crew, which lets you immediately make the model suffer damage from poison equal to the current value of its poison, capped at 5, so that it combos well with perverse metabolism, and then they lose 5 stacks of poison, which, with his built-in infect on his melee attack, is incredibly strong. McMorning Insanitary loses some of the punch on his melee and can't ignore basically all of the defensive tech in the game anymore, but he more than makes up for that with his newfound surgery skill. The action Desperate Plot lets him move a friendly model and remove a marker that it moved over. Then, depending on the type of marker it removed, it gives the model an upgrade sewn onto it that gives it extra stats and a fancy new ability, as well as the ability to discard the upgrade to drop that type of marker and then reduce the incoming damage that it would take. He also gains Don't Mind Me, so he can scheme while he's engaged, and he causes killed models that have poison three or more to drop an extra corpse when they die which is amazingly good with his corpse comboy nonsense. And every single activation, he can also gain a benefit from the first two markers that are removed near him. Each activation, he can draw a card when a marker is removed, and he can just drop the same type of marker once per activation when a marker is removed. And he gets the ability to copy actions from models and plastic surgery them onto his friendly keyword models, similar to the mimic abilities from some Neverborn bits. And it attaches poison to the model to boot. So McMorning as a whole is a really neat crew that poisons everything, staples scraps and corpses together, and does all kind of combo stuff with the poison condition and corpse markers. He's pretty good at scheming. He has a, a wide variety of models in his keyword, but regardless of which version, he is amazing at murdering the enemy. Centuries ago, Yan Lo stood against an invasion from another realm. In the process of doing so, he was cursed to walk the spirit realm, unable to make his way back to the physical world. He wandered the different paths of the spirit world, until eventually he was able to make contact with the real world through the devotion and focus of his ancestors. He finally found himself able to remember who he was, but was unable to manifest a physical form for very long, until his niece Chiaki came to Malifo. During his time in the spirit world, he made contact with several of his ancestors and helped to bring them back to Malifo. He served the Ten Thunders in exchange for information about his past, and he's recently learned about a coming incursion from the Oni from the beyond. These creatures are the same ones who tried to invade centuries ago, and now he's focusing his attention on resisting their newest incursion into Earth. Yanlo is a master who actually has two keywords, Ancestor and Retainer, and it's pretty cool because his whole crew is themed around his ancestors, these different powerful models who, when they die, their spirit sticks around and buffs the other models on the table. There's a bunch of them, and they're all pretty strange, but then on the other side, you have a bunch of minions who work with those buffs and can actually bring back some of the ancestors. So there's a lot of good variety there, and it's a really cool-looking crew. Azamu in particular is one of my favorites. It's a big suit of samurai armor that's just inhabited by a spirit. There's no body inside. But now let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us a little bit more about how Yan Lo plays. Lo Pan- I mean, Yan Lo leads the ancestor and retainer crew, his physical and spiritual descendants all the way down to modern day, and their most trusted advisors and vassals. Yanlo's crew has a wide variety of killy and schemy models that belong to one or two different keywords, Ancestor and Retainer. The models that are in the Ancestor keyword are Yanlo's literal descendant family members, and they each have a special upgrade called a Reliquary that you can attach to a friendly model near them when they die to provide some of their abilities that that model had before it died so they could live on through their new host. Every upgrade 
comes with a special action also that can rehome that reliquary to another nearby model. The original version of Yanlo is a master that gets stronger and stronger every turn as he gets to attach one of his ascendant upgrades, which provide him with a bunch of new abilities, sometimes new actions, and a special bonus one-time effect for attaching it. And every duel that Yanlo takes is increased by the number of ascendant upgrades he has on them, capping out at a total of plus three on the third turn which is a common theme with many of his actions and abilities getting stronger or only being usable from turn three onwards. He can move around the board very quickly, he has a pretty good ranged attack, and he can resummon his slayed ancestors, buff and heal friendly models, and can sacrifice the reliquary upgrades on one of his slain ancestors to cheat death if he would be killed. Yanlo the Spirit Walker loses a lot of his mobility and the Ascendant upgrades altogether, and instead attaches his own reliquary to a tethered retainer model or his totem at the start of the game, which can move around like normal. And he gains increased benefits from models getting retainer upgrades in a variety of ways. He also has an amazing bonus action that can move models and put scheme markers down, an action that can stack his own deck, the powerful obey action, and twist reality, a moderately damaged ranged attack that allows you to choose your resist against defense or willpower, and flat out ignores armor and incorporeal. Altogether, Yanlo takes a little bit of while to get going, but has an incredibly diverse keyword. Access to Manos, who's one of the best henchmen in the Resurrectionist faction, and Yanlo as a whole really rewards careful planning and proper respect for your ancestors. Von Stuck was an astronomy professor on Earth, and he came to Malifaux to study the stars. But while his colleagues in other fields were able to make tremendous progress in the sciences in Malifaux, Von Stuck had no such luck. The stars didn't seem to make any sense in Malifaux, not obeying the laws of physics, or moving by any particular pattern. None of it made any sense, and soon Von Stuck's sanity began slipping. Soon he didn't even want to see the stars, so he moved down into an underground cistern to hide. While down there, Von Stuck turned to necromancy, and after many months, he invited his scientific colleagues out for drinks, and they were never seen again. Since then, Von Stuck has been broadcasting over the Aethervox, giving lessons on how to raise the dead and augment them with mechanical parts. He calls this the University of Transmortis, and his students join him in the cistern and have their lives changed forever. For a long time, Professor Von Stuck was quite reclusive, keeping the university isolated, but more recently, he's begun reaching out to the other necromancers. Having re-emerged from his underground lair, he's even looked back up at the sky and become inspired again. Professor Von Stuck is funny because he treats his university like a real school, but it's really just full of zombies and mechanical construct hybrids that kind of lumber around, and he tries to teach them how to do surgery. The stuff in his crew is all really creepy looking. If you're not into body horror, then maybe don't, maybe don't look at it. But if you can't decide whether you like zombies or robots, then... This is definitely the crew for you because everything is pretty much a little bit of both. But now let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Von Stuck and the Transmortis keyword. Albus Von Stuck leads the Transmortis crew, his half machine, half zombie institution of higher learning and insanity. The nearly entire Transmortis keyword has multiple characteristics, usually undead in construct, but there are also a few living, and a unique ability called Studied Opponent, which lets you draw a card after resolving any duel with an enemy model that you both had the same suit in. And for that reason, sometimes you'll see a bunch of models have suits built in when they don't have a trigger that they can declare on it, just to raise the likelihood that you'll draw cards off of it. Many of the models also have hard to wound and armor, which makes them very durable, and the crew has two excellent henchmen, or henchwomen really, in the Valedictorian, a flying murder machine, and Anna Lovelace, who is an excellent out-of-keyword hire for any Rezzer crew because of her two amazing aura abilities. Hostile work environment, which makes enemy models not be able to target each other near her, and gravity well, which prevents models from being placed near her by your opponent, which prevents flight, summoning, and a host of other effects. And both of those are a 13 or so inch circle on the board, which can be insanely, insanely strong. In addition, the keyword has access to a number of different minions that you can hire to customize their unique targeted abilities to fight the crew that you're squaring up against with all kinds of built-in counter tech, like armor piercing, stopping charges without having to pass a high TN willpower duel, and healing your own models. Von Stuck himself, in his original version, has great willpower, he can't be stunned, and he prevents two damage from all attacks that target him that don't declare a trigger against him, which is amazing if you've been stunning him with your crew-wide bonus action. 
He also has the ability to shut off enemy upgrades with academic superiority, and he gets a free scheme marker with his keyword models killing enemy models anywhere within 10 inches of him. He doesn't have a melee attack or an engagement range, but he can focus or move all of his friendly models near him, and he has a decent ranged attack and can upgrade his models with lecture upgrades, which give the attached model the ability to discard the upgrade whenever it kills an enemy model and summon a minion that costs the same or less as the killed model. They come in with slow, and if they're not near Von Stuck, they'll take a little bit of damage, but you can summon any keyword, and as I previously discussed, they have all kinds of different tailored models for specific circumstances with specific counterattack. The title version, Von Stuck Stargazer, has come back out of retirement and has learned all kinds of lessons. He's gotten hard to wound, he makes enemies attack him and nearby models with willpower, suffering negative flips, and he's figured out how to get friendly models plus flips for the rest of any activation in which they fail a duel. He also lets all Transmortis models treat anyone near a friendly scheme marker as having an extra characteristic, so living, undead, beast, or construct, which is super useful for turning on all kinds of abilities all over the crew, but in particular is extra helpful for his signature action, Study of Anatomy, which gives a plethora of effects based on which characteristics the target has, and there's always a good effect and a bad effect, so you're basically going to be using the good effects if you're targeting your models and the bad ones if you're targeting enemies. He also now has a pretty beefy melee attack that summons a zombie protector, which you have to kill before you can attack Von Stuck if he's near him and an eligible target. He has a great shockwave attack that drops a scheme marker and heals friendly models, uh, friendly keyword models. And his bonus action is a super unique ability that makes enemy models be completely ignored for schemes and strategies and unable to interact until the next start phase. It is an opposed duel, so you have to beat the model you target with it, but it is completely insane because if you do it on the fifth turn, they will be ignored for end game scoring. All in all, there is a reason that this crew has had a bunch of its models nerfed, and a combination of the card velocity, the incredible durability, and the amazingly flexible hiring options make this a top-tier crew that is great for new players and for high skill players alike and can win in almost any circumstance. Reva was born to a wealthy family, and she was always a little bit strange. But it got much worse when her family brought her to Malifaux, and she began hanging out in graveyards and talking to spirits that no one could see. She even had a strange ability to inspire a sense of purpose in the people around her that no one could explain. Her parents took her to doctors, desperately trying to figure out what was wrong with her, to no avail. Eventually, they hired an exorcist, and when Vincent showed up, instead of doing his job, he decided to rescue Reva from her family. She wandered the quarantine zone gathering followers, and unlike most residents of Malifaux who are terrified of the undead, she welcomed them to her following. She treated these zombies with the respect that she would anyone else, which led to many people shunning her and some resorting to violence. She and her followers found safety in the quarantine zone, in the abandoned facility that the Free Corps used to use as their base. Now she spends her time trying to ease the suffering of the dying and providing a safe refuge for the undead. Riva is like a little cult leader. She's got all these followers that are really obsessed with her, and it seems like what she's doing is a good thing, but she's also kind of magically manipulating people and making them do what she wants, so it's kind of weird. Her crew is a little unusual, and I'm not sure there's really a clear through line between all of them, but she's got some really interesting looking models like the lamp ads, and there's a little bit of a fire theme that kind of underlines all of them. But with that, let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Reva and the Revenant keyword. Reva McIntyre, I mean Cortinas leads the Revenant crew, the marginalized living and undead who follow her nurturing presence with the hope to see a better tomorrow. Much like McMorning, this crew revolves around a damaging condition, but in this case it's burning instead of poison, and the markers that cause hazardous burning, pyre markers. Nearly the entire crew has the ability to drop pyre markers in base contact with a model it kills before it's removed, called funeral pyre, and most of them have Spirits in the Flames, an ability that lets them treat the first Pyre Marker they move through each activation as Hazardous Shielded, in addition to Hazardous Burning, which gives protection against the burning if it doesn't stop a more direct attack during the activation. And many of the models have the ability Final Veil, which lets them heal one any time a model with an Aura 6 of them dies. Reva's totems are called Corpse Candles, which are designed to die repeatedly and be summoned back over and over again, and they drop pyre markers and corpse markers when they do die, which enables all of the crew's abilities. Original Reva is a big horse lady, so she's a 50 mil, she's size 3, and she's unimpeded, and she has the unique ability to lower burning on a friendly model near her 
including herself, to get plus flips on any duel, which effectively means if you say her a pyre marker, all of her actions will come with her free plus flip, but it gets even stronger because of her melee attack, which has a 2-inch range, but she can draw its range and line of sight from any corpse marker or friendly model with the shielded condition within or 8 of her. And it's a great min 3 attack with some good triggers, so it can be very, very strong. She also gets to summon back one of her corpse candles for free at the start of her activation by removing a corpse marker or pyre marker, and that's in both versions. But the original version can also reduce the burning on a model to heal it, and she has a couple of decent ranged options. Reva Luminary, her title version, changes the game completely. She's on foot now. She's lost out on the plus slips that she gets directly from burning, but instead, she gained the ability to reduce any damage that she takes to zero by killing a friendly model near her, like a corpse candle or a ghost light. And she has two wild abilities that really turn up the heat. Once per activation, when a pyre marker is dropped in her line of sight, every model within pulse two of it can be pushed two inches in any direction. Usually, that means into the pyre marker that was dropped. And the first time any model within aura 8 of her gains burning each turn, Reva makes them either heal one or take one damage. Combining those with her tactical action, which pushes pyre markers around, and has a trigger to teleport two models that were touching the pyre marker before it moved to its end position, all of those things proc the ability for your models to gain burning and shielded likely. And a bonus action that she has lets her lower burning to transfer it all to someone else. And it has a really unique trigger on it that lets any model within or a four of the target that has shielded get plus one damage to all of their attacks. Which works really, really well with Vincent, her henchman, who has a blessed crossbow that can automatically kill summon models with the exorcism trigger. Finally, Revoluminary has a new attack action that causes a model to take damage from its burning condition equal to the value of its burning, then reduce its burning by 5, and if that kills the model, it doesn't drop any markers, and once per turn you can declare a trigger that if the model dies, you get to summon a lamp pad for free, one of her really expensive and very powerful minions, off of the killed model, which is just overall very, very good. All in all, Riva has a lot of marker spam, so she's very susceptible to marker removal crews. That really screws her up a bit. And she can really ping things down as well. So she does pretty well against armored opponents or opponents with evasive abilities and low health. And the original version is just a great beat stick. She doesn't have a lot of in-keyword scheme ability, though. So I would, you know, try and take her in a more melee-oriented pool. After being weakened by Titania and the Grave Spirit, many of the tyrants began trying to claw back some of their power. Shezul was a menace, and led his forces to war, and fed on the blood of his victims, causing him to get stronger and stronger the more that he killed. It seemed like the inhabitants of Malifaux at the time, the true Nephilim, would not be able to stand against his onslaught. But soon a plan came together, and the Black Blood ritual was performed, transforming the red blood that satiated Shezul, and flowed through all of their veins, into a black ichor. This would no longer empower the tyrant, and allow the true Nephilim to finally turn the tide of the battle. But one of the true Nephilim didn't seem to be affected by this ritual. Castor was one of the oldest and most powerful of all the true Nephilim, and after the ritual, he found that no matter how much he ate, he was never satiated. He went starving for a long period of time, until in a fit of starvation, he finally attacked one of his own. It turned out that the only way he could nourish himself was through the black blood of his own brothers and sisters. Not wanting to continue this practice, he decided to entomb himself, laying in a suspended state, still alive, but not needing to feed on his own people. He's only awakened in times of great need, and he has to gorge himself on black blood in order to regain his power upon waking. He had supported Lilith's claim to the throne before going back to sleep last time, but now with all the chaos going on in Malifaux, Nikima has woken him up to seek his help. Castor is the newest master in the Resurrectionist, and he's also dual faction with Neverborn. He's kind of like a Nephilim vampire, and while he has some things in common with the Nephilim keyword, there's a lot of different stuff going on in his crew. His models tend to look a little bit more undead and zombie-like, and it's brought us some really interesting new models and playstyles to the game. His totem is actually a living blade, which is a really powerful sword that some of the Neverborn have. But in this case, Marathon actually goes off on its own and fights independently of Castor, which is really cool. And also, it can't die, which is kind of interesting too. But with that, one more time, let's go back over to Brandon, who's going to tell us more about Castor and the return keyword. Castor leads the returned crew. Having recently arisen from his torpor, his models are all about healing and moving forward. The crew's main mechanic is overhealing. Almost every model in the crew gets a bonus when they overheal, 
and many of the models heal at the start of their activation, or can take damage at the start of their activation to allow a friendly model to heal. Usually the bonus is extra mobility, but some models have different options. The crew has a lot of ways to pump out damage and is, is really focused on being sort of around each other and near each other to gain the benefit of overheal buffs, as well as a number of other auras like the urn bearers being able to turn overheal into shielded and then eventually focus and more healing, or the unsealy engines protecting the crew from enemy non-melee attacks and stun. Gwyll is an amazing support piece that can turn any amount of healing down to zero as long as it's in Gwyll's line of sight and make it count as an overheal. And he has a bunch of other support abilities and card manipulation abilities. The other henchman, Atherak, can put up wards that protect the crew from ranged attacks and give out shielded when friendly models overheal near them, making them more durable. Castor's totem is, is really interesting, Marathine, in that it can't die or take damage as long as Castor is in play. And if he dies, you lose it as well, but it has an okay attack that heals Castor equal to the damage it deals, and it can remove enemy scheme markers as an action, but it never counts as being engaged or engaging, and anyone can move through it, and it can move through other models. Castor Awakened allows his models near him to interact in the end phase, which is incredibly powerful, as usually it can't be stopped at that point, or interacted with in any way. And he has a pretty good melee attack that can heal himself, and he has one of the nastiest debilitation attacks in the game in Dominate that stuns and staggers an enemy non-master, and also can let them take a general action like charge, unhindered by the stagger, or Castor's models. And Castor Awaken lets Marathine move and drop a ski marker as his bonus action, as well as allowing him to pulse out damage from it whenever he overheals. Castor Fervent, however, is much less into scheming and much more into murder. He's grown terrifying and ruthless, and ignores severe and hazardous terrain and can move through models now because he's so large. He also ignores friendly and black blood caused damage, and instead, once per activation, can heal one from it, triggering his overheal. His melee attack has gotten a lot scarier, and gets blasts automatically, two of them, whenever he charges, and he can teleport into one of those blast markers. He also has an attack that just straight up abducts enemy models and puts them in base contact with him after he pushes six inches in any direction. And his bonus ability allows Marathine to teleport and then charge. Altogether, the return crew is a very, very scary opponent, and they heal like it's nobody's business. And that's it for the Resurrectionists. Now, hopefully, after watching that, you can pick out which of these masters is going to be your favorite, or maybe there's multiple that you really like. But either way, get down in the comments below and let us know who your favorite master is and if your opinion changed after watching this video. I want to say a huge thank you to McBluff for providing extra commentary on McMorning, and of course to Danger Planet, especially Brandon in this case, for contributing the segments about the gameplay. Don't forget to check out both of their channels, they'll be linked below as well. I also want to thank everybody who sent in pictures for this video. They're super helpful, and they really add a lot to these videos, so thanks a ton. We have one more episode in this series left for the Outcast, so if you'd be interested in sending in your pictures of painted models, then send them to this email address, and don't forget to let me know how to credit you. But with that, I want to send a huge thank you to the extremely cool kids here on Patreon, the Steam Pound Scoundrels, Dogmatize, Devin, and the Spill Paint Pod. Thanks for watching.